Periscope. It's bright and early, 1024 Eastern Time. So those of you on Central Time, I know it's early. But I was up before the sun was up just seeking the Lord. And um, he's been speaking a lot. So I may do a couple of these. I haven't forgotten about prophetic training. I will do that. Good morning, everyone. I see you. I see you. Um, I haven't forgotten about the prophetic training, but um, I was periscoping on yesterday, and I made a statement, and then these questions began coming up, how to die to the flesh. So in prayer this morning, I really felt prompted by the Lord to really deal with this whole subject of um, death to flesh. And that's why I call it spiritual homicide. Death to flesh. How do you kill this old man? So we're going to deal with this. Um, I saw someone say I, I was watching your prophetic training on YouTube. Bless you. So we're going to deal with this um, flesh thing. And I went way back. Uh, Death to flesh is one of my first messages. One of my first uh, revelations, uh, one of the first things God began to speak to me about very heavily, and I began to study out, um, began to study out a lot back in like 2004, 2005, and um, when I witnessed to people on my job, and I was working at FedEx at the time, uh, right before I left my job and began to travel in full time ministry in the year 2005, I was working at FedEx, and at that time I was working at the Hub. And I told y'all about how when I graduated high school, I had a really good job at the FedEx headquarters, uh, full-time job, um, making really good money right there at the headquarters of FedEx in Memphis, Tennessee. But that's my work history. And um, I'm telling you that because that was my witnessing ground. That is where I began to um, try to win people to Jesus. And this was my message death to flesh, spiritual homicide. And it was important to me because the difference between the early church and the church of today is um, we make Christians and the early church made disciples. And Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Uh, now, that's, that, that was very, those were very explicit words for Jesus to say, take up your cross and follow me. He said, take up an instrument of death. Put it on your flesh and follow me. Matter of fact, take it up every day. And you jump further into the New Testament and you see what Paul said, I die daily. Why is that? Because, um, listen, don't, don't, don't argue uh, with the people coming and people. Let's get in this word. All right. Don't be distracted. Um, he said, I die daily. Why? Because I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you prophesy. I don't care how many people you raise from the dead. I don't care how many sicknesses I heal in your services. I don't care how much uh, you operate in the gifts of the spirit. I don't care how much of the glory comes in your prayer. When you wake up every morning, your flesh is going to wake up with you. And that's the problem with the church. We're spiritual, but we're still carnal at the same time. And that's what it means to be double-minded. It means you're in and out of the spirit. At church, you're in the spirit. But at work, you're in a different spirit. So um, we got to get that under control. We got to learn how to become disciples and how to discipline ourselves to kill this flesh and put this old man to rest. Um, so remember the Corinthian church? They were the most gifted, one of the most gifted churches in the New Testament. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, every gift of the Spirit was in operation at the church in Corinth. Uh, they prophesied the word of knowledge. I mean, they were a powerhouse church. But and Paul said of them in 1 Corinthians 3, um, are you not yet still carnal? And some of the most carnal people happen to be some of the most spiritual people. And the reason for that, Colossians 2 and 20, verse 23, the Bible says that the doctrines of men and um, the ordinances, uh, uh, touch not, taste not, uh, religious practices cannot satisfy, I'm paraphrasing this, to the 
death of the flesh. I don't care how religious you get. Your flesh is still going to wake up and say, feed me. All right. Your flesh is going to want to have its way. So um, this session is about learning how to kill that flesh. All right. So I, I would do a shout out. But I don't want to take time doing a shout out because I'm going to do a couple of these. But if you want, for people that's going to watch the uh, replay, go ahead and shout out your nation. We have people watching this from nations. We have people watching watching this from all over America. And um, I don't think I've had less than a thousand, an average of less than a thousand um, live viewers. Um, on these periscopes where I teach and get into the word. So people are tuning in. So go ahead. I won't call it out, um, but go ahead and shout out your city while I'm teaching. Just make sure you're still paying attention because I want to deal with this. All right. There is a way you can walk holy. You can walk in the spirit. You can uh, walk in God. And the Bible says in Jude 24, he is able to keep you from falling. So those of you watching the replay, you see who's watching. You may see some people from your area. So join the party. Amen. So let's deal with this because, like I was saying in Colossians 2 and 20, um, Colossians 2 and 20, religious practice does not satisfy the flesh. Really, you have to read Colossians 2 verses 20 through 23. All right. So I don't care how deep you think you are. Uh, you have to realize that your flesh it's still alive. The Bible says when um, you think you stand, take heed unless you fall. And that's the first Corinthians. I think it's chapter 10. It says when you think you stand, take heed unless you fall. Then jump over to Galatians chapter six, verse one. It says if you see your brother overtaken in a fault, it says uh, restore him. It says if you're spiritual, restore him in the spirit of meekness. Unless you also be tempted. What does that mean? No one is exempt from temptation. So if you don't know how to deal with temptation, then you will fall in it. So uh, a lot of people, uh, we just go with the say, well, nobody's perfect. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. And uh, yes, everyone makes mistakes. The only problem with that is the issue is not that everyone makes mistakes. The issue is not our imperfection. The issue is our a lack of knowing how to deal with this old man, with this flesh. Now, I'm going to get into more of that later, but let me, I keep saying flesh and some people may be watching and say, what is the flesh? All right. So the word flesh and the word carnal um, is used interchangeably in the scripture. All right. So the word carnal comes from a Greek word where we get our were carnivore. So the flesh or carnality is your animal nature. All right. And another definition deals with um, your appetites. These are instinctive uh, bodily appetites and needs like your body needs certain things. All right. Um, now I'm going deep now. So stay with me if you Get lost. Don't get discouraged. Just watch the replay. All right. And I'm giving you a lot of scriptures so you'll be able to search this in the Bible yourself. But you have you have natural bodily needs and appetites like you have an appetite for food, a need for food, uh, sleep. Um, sex is actually a God given instinctive need. All right. The only problem is um, even though God has given it to you, look, listen, sex is holy. The Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled, is holy. So uh, the problem that people run into with sexual desires is not knowing how to tame that. All right. Because um, the only sex, the only safe sex is within the confines of marriage. All right. So, um, you know, the, the, OK, I don't even want to go deep in that. It's not a sex subject. This is um, spiritual homicide. So you have these bodily appetites, these instinctive needs that are normal, they're natural, and they are godly. All right. So a lot of times people, we get sanctimonious in the sense of we try to ignore our normal, natural needs in order 
to and um, our attempt to live holy. And that's not going to help you. All right, you have to acknowledge that there's certain things that your body thirsts for. All right, um, like okay, so food. All right, so when temptation comes in and 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 deals with you and and tries to deceive you into gluttony, there's nothing wrong with eating. Hey man, just something wrong with eating too much. Uh, sleep and rest. There's nothing wrong with sleeping. There's just something wrong with sleeping too much. It's called laziness. All right. There's nothing wrong with sex. Is there something wrong with sex outside of marriage? It's called adultery because sex. I mean, uh, adultery and fornication are two different things. All right. Um, uh, fornication is not sex before marriage. Adultery is really classified as sex before marriage or any type of sex outside of the confines of marriage. So if I'm cheating on my wife or if I'm sleeping with someone before I'm married, that's called adultery. And the word fornication is sexual looseness. Now, whenever you see fornication in the scriptures, I don't know why I'm going deep into this, but most of the spiritual people in the Corinthians has sexual issues. All right. Why? Because when you get in the spirit now, those of you who like to shout, those of you who like to worship, you need to understand when you get in the spirit, it stirs up all of your, um, all, everything within you, your bodily desires, your spiritual desires. And if you don't get that under control, some of the most spiritual people are some of the most carnal people. That's remember I talked about the Corinthian church. So, uh, normally, when you see the word fornication, um, it was tied to idolatry. Sometimes the worship of demons, false gods, um, it was tied to idolatry. Then you have lasciviousness. That is a state of nudity. So that's when pornography comes in. Now, fornication deals with sexual looseness. That can include oral sex, um, all kind of stuff. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into that. So... Um, Dealing with this flesh, your body has natural appetites, all right? So when God made you, he made you a tripart being. Remember in Corinthians, it says, Know ye not that your body is the spirit, I mean, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I got distracted looking at someone's comment. He says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Why is that important? Because the temple was tripart. Outer court, inner court, most holy place. All right. Outer court, what's that? That's your flesh. That's your body. Inner court, what's that? That's your soul. All right. What is your soul? Your soul is uh, your mind, your will, and your emotions. What is your mind? Your mind is I think. What is your will? Your will is I won't. What is your emotions? Your, your emotions is uh, I feel. So your soul is comprised of I won't, I feel, I think. All right, so when you get into I want, I feel, I think, that's your soul. All right, and then you have the most holy place, the third part of you. Um, that is your spirit. All right, so um, I don't want to get too deep into that, but you can read that in First Thessalonians, I believe, verse 23. It says that God will sanctify you completely, uh, spirit, soul, and body. All right, so... Uh, when Adam sinned, remember God said, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm talking about the flesh. Okay. How did the carnal nature come into existence? All right. So God made Adam spirit, soul, and body. All right. But when he sinned, he said, the day you eat this fruit, you will surely die. All right. So Adam did die, but he died spiritually first. That's why in Ephesians 2 and 7, it says he has made us alive in Christ. All right. What does it mean? Made us alive. It says when we get saved, we are made alive. All right. But we're already alive naturally. So it's not talking about being alive naturally. It's talking about coming alive spiritually. So when Adam died, he died spiritually first. And that is when the carnal nature came into existence. Because when God made Adam, he made him a spirit, gave him a soul to live in a body. All right. So his spirit um, dominated the um, his spirit dominated um, the state of his soul. But when his spirit died, then his body began to dominate the decisions, the feelings, and the choices of his soul. All right. So those appetites that I was talking about, those natural, inborn, instinctive appetites, appetite for food, sleep, sex, um, comfort, 
Those things went animal. All right. Now, why is it important? Remember, I told you the word carnal comes from the Greek word from where we get the word uh, carnivore. So the carnal nature is the animal nature. Why is that important to understand? When God made animal and when God made man, he made them from the same technology. All right. He made them from the dirt. And the only thing that separates man from animal is when God breathed his spirit in them. So you, me, without the spirit of God, we're just a bunch of animals. I'm an animal. You're an animal. Your mama animal. Your daddy animal. Your grandmama animal. I like saying that. I just love saying it. It just it blesses me. Uh, I'm going to say it again. You're an animal. Your mama animal. Your daddy animal. Your grandmama animal. See, we don't like that because we don't like the face to facts that your flesh has gone wild. Flesh gone wild. All right. Without the spirit of God, your flesh dominates the choices, the emotions, and even your thought patterns. So, this is getting to the flesh. When we look at the flesh, the carnal nature, let's read this in um, Galatians 5. All right? Now, share this with your followers. So, everyone, I'm about to jump in this word. Galatians 5, so everyone can see this and don't miss it. I am going to write a book on this. Oh, that's Pastor Brown. Yeah. Bless you, Pastor. Um, I am going to write a book on this. It's going to be called The Alter Ego. All right. It's two U's. You got the old you and the new you. All right. And church people are bipolar. They're schizo. They one minute they say, the next minute you're not saved because they don't know how to die to the flesh. All right. It's called a double mind. The word double mind, that phrase actually means to have double soul. So at church you want one thing, but in the world you want another thing. And it says a double-minded man cannot receive anything from God. All right? So until you die to the flesh. Now remember, there's only two times the Bible says you cannot please God. It says without faith you cannot please God. And it says in the flesh you cannot please God. What does that mean? You cannot have faith in the flesh. All right? So that's why it says a double-minded man cannot expect to receive anything from God because your flesh will dominate your faith. So you got to learn how to dominate your flesh so that it won't dominate your faith. All right? So Galatians 5, now that, that's a tweet right there. Dominate your flesh so that it will not dominate your faith. I'm going to say it again. Dominate your flesh. Yeah, I like that. It's unstable. Left, don't know left from right. Okay, let me let me finish the tweet. Dominate your flesh so that you it will not dominate your faith. Some of you say, well, I try to believe God. I'm trying to do this. I thought I was believing God. I prayed for this. It didn't happen. Well, you maybe your flesh is too alive. All right? Because the carnal man cannot expect to receive anything from God. It cannot receive. It cannot receive. A lot of times, you know, when I'm in services, I purposely try not to touch people because I like people seeing that God can touch people without man touching them. All right. And the power of God be knocking. If y'all y'all seen it on YouTube. Power of God be knocking people out. Sometimes I don't even be looking at people. I turn around and I'm going another direction. Five people fall out on the left. I'm looking at the right. So I like God demonstrating his power in that type of way. To show people that uh, I don't have to touch them. When God is in the room, he's moving. You don't have to get it from me. You don't have to wait till I prophesy to you. Why am I saying that? Because a lot of people, they come up to me um, in services and they're trying to fall out. Or they're trying to feel something. And you, the flesh cannot receive from God. Alright? So you have to get in the place where you learn how to receive in the spirit. Alright? And flesh will not allow you. That's why double-minded, that alter ego um, will not allow you. It makes you unstable. You cannot receive from God that type of way. You know, go further. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, it is hostile against God. Your flesh will wrestle and fight with God. Your flesh will argue with the God that's trying to bless you. Have you ever tried to give some? You know, see, 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 flesh against the spirit is like God he has a gift in his hand. He, he's reaching out to give you the gift. And then you take his hand and try to break his arm. That's what flesh does. It's hostile. All right. It, it'll fight God. It'll curse God. The flesh uh, believe God one day. Don't believe God the next day. Flesh drops out of church. Flesh says all oh, pastors. I, don't, I can't trust no pastors no more. Well, my pa flesh, flesh will blame people to drop out of God. 
Now, I just said a word right there. So you have to learn how to die to this flesh. And that's the first lesson you learn as a disciple. That's the difference between being a saint and an ain't. That's the difference between being a Christian and a disciple is how much do you take up your cross? Now, I'm going to get into this. We're just at surface level. All right. My wife is on here. Y'all follow her. She said, now, nah, that's a word. Come in again, babe. Y'all follow her because she's about to do her girl talk in just a minute. All right, now let's deal with flesh because we have to understand the flesh if we're going to deal with it and kill it. So let's deal with it. All right, uh, uh, Galatians 5. Now this is surface level of flesh. I'm going to deal with three dimensions of the flesh from the Bible. All right, um, three areas you got to target in your life to make sure your flesh is dead. All right. And many started Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, and that's surface level flesh. And people don't understand that you trying to do better is not going to kill your flesh. Living holy is not about trying to do better. Listen, Romans 8 and 13, it says, we by the spirit mortify the deeds of the body and live. You know what mortify means? It means to kill it. Now, I think about dead stuff and after so long, rigor mortis set in. That means uh, rigor mortis is when... Uh, it is stiffens. It gets hard. All right. It is as hard to move a dead body, a dead flesh. It gets no response anymore. All right. You know, well, I'm not going to go that deep, but um, you got to kill that flesh until rigor mortis set in, until your flesh has no response. All right. So um, you can only do that in the spirit. Romans 8 and 13 and also Galatians 5 and 16. It says that uh, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's good to say that I'm going to teach you how to do it. I'm, I'm going to give you three steps. I'm going to give you three steps on how to walk in the spirit and how to kill the flesh. But let me keep explaining this, okay? Um, now, all the carnal people are dropped off here. People don't want to hear how to die, how to, how to, die to the flesh. But um, if you're struggling... Listen, some of y'all ain't got sex demons. You have sexual decisions. All right? Don't blame everything on the devil. Uh, some of our struggles is just, is just a decision. We have not made up in our mind. And see, spiritual people, the moment we mess up, we, we blame it on the devil. All right? So let, let me get into this so I can give you some good doctrine and uh, foundation. So Galatians 5 and 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh... Are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Now that's a good one. Because a lot of preachers preach in the flesh. And a bad teaching is called a heresy. Right? And I just had to stop right there. Heresies, flesh. What is, what is a flesh? What flesh causes you to start teaching heresy? Flesh wants you to feel like you have to have the next best revelation all the time, the next best sermon all the time. Listen, sometimes we just got to go back to the basics. Sometimes it's not about what the new sermon title is, what the new sermon series is, all right? And some and some of our attempts, I'm talking to preachers now, because preachers can be in the flesh too. And most of the preachers live in the flesh at verse 20, Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. And heresies, always ears itching to hear some new word, all right? Just all over the place, just making up revelations, all right? We don't have to do that. We just stick with the Bible. Amen. So uh, let me get back into this. But listen, the list goes on in Galatians 5, starting at verse 19, talking about the works of the flesh, the works of the flesh. Now, notice in verse 19, it says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. You see that the works of the flesh are manifest. You see that? Let me read it again. The works of the flesh are are manifest by the time you sin you've already undergone a process of manifestation into that sin and that's heavy right there and a lot of people try to stop 
the works of the flesh without dealing with the carnal nature and you will fail every time. You will always commit adultery, trying not to commit adultery. You will always fornicate, trying not to fornicate. You will always be, an, be unclean, trying to be clean. You will always be an idolater, trying not to get an idolatry. That's the works of the flesh. They, they manifest. <coughs> I'm coughing and everything. Excuse me, y'all. Look at the devil. I'm all in my throat. You see me blaming the devil. Name the devil. Um, now, look at this. The works of the flesh. Now, now, I'm ready to go deep. I'm ready to go deep. The, by the time you try to stop the works of the flesh, it's already too late. So, there are three dimensions of the flesh you got to look at. You have the mind of the flesh. That's Romans chapter 8. You have the lust of the flesh. Well, Romans chapter 8 verse 5. That's the mind of the flesh. It's going to say the carnal mind. But remember, the word carnal and the word flesh is used interchangeably. So whenever you see the word carnal, it's talking about flesh. Whenever you see the word flesh, it's talking about carnality. All right. So you have the mind of the flesh. Romans chapter 8 verse 5. You have the lust of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. And then you have the works of the flesh. All right. Now, how deep do y'all want me to go on this? Just let me know really quick. Because I can go really deep. How deep you want me to go on this? I can stay surface. Or I can go deeper. Go in. Mind of the flesh. Deep. Go deeper. Deep. We need deep, deep cry out. <laughs> Get down in there. All right, y'all say y'all wanted it. So, there are three dimensions of flesh. The mind of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the works of the flesh. Listen, even when it comes to sin, sin is categorized. Uh, I'm treading, I'm treading, um, some grounds here. So y'all pray for me. Because I got to say this. Right? So by the time you sin and get to the, the works of the flesh. So you have sin. You have iniquity. And you have transgression. Alright? Now look at this. Because everyone say, well all sin is sin. That's not biblical. Now all sin is forgiven the same. But not all sin is weighed the same. Remember when the man delivered Jesus to Pilate? Or Pilate uh, delivered Jesus up to die? He said, Jesus, I don't want to kill you. I don't want to see you to be executed. But these people have voted. And uh, you got to die. And Jesus said, Pilate, don't worry about it. Because the people that delivered you to me have the greater sin. Just ponder that. So all sin... Is dealt with the same by the blood. It's forgiven the same. There is no sin that's too deep that cannot be forgiven. Let me say that again. There is no sin that is too gross, too deep, too dark that cannot be forgiven. But you have to understand is all sin is not weighed the same. There are levels to this thing. All right. For example, the book of Proverbs, it says six things the Lord hate. And seven are an abomination. It's classified. All right. So there's some things that when you see people in those acts of sin, they're in a darker place of iniquity. Now, I know that doesn't sound good. I know we try to avoid that. You try to try to make people feel better about themselves. But let me I'm, I'm just let me just say this. Well, I'm not going to say it. Should I say it? I'm looking at your comments because I'm trying to see. Yeah, blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. That's a good example. That's a good example. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Sin. Okay, look at look at what David said. For example, when you see people getting into, uh, for example, let me see. I'm trying not to go there because I'm trying not to change the direction of this teaching too much. So. Um, all sins are not way the same. We'll start at that. If you want to go deeper in that teaching, go to YouTube. Look up a message I did called Repentance. Subtitled Breaking Cycles of Iniquity. All right. 
breaking cycle and patterns of iniquity. Now, David said in Psalm 51, he said, Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity, and cleanse me of my sin. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity, and cleanse me of my sin. All right. So look at what it what he got when he got the transgressions. He said, "Bottom out, erase them." What's the transgression? That's a blatant act of rebellion and disobedience. What's an iniquity? That's the very seed of sin. All right. Iniquity is uh, it means to bend. It's the underlying cause of sin. See, the work of the flesh is what you do. The iniquity is what causes you to do it. See, we try to stop getting drunk. We try to stop fornicating. We try to stop uh, idolatry. We try to stop adultery. But that's not how you deal with it. That's your transgression. That's the work of the flesh. But the iniquity is the lust of that flesh. That's what you have to target. And the Bible has a remedy for that. All right. Then you have the mind of the flesh. All right. I'm getting back over into the spirit. That's your mentality. Romans 12. It says, be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Why? Because Romans chapter 8, the carnal mind is hostile, enmity against God. So as long as you try to act right and think wrong, it won't work. All right. So you have to get in the word of God to renew your mind if you're going to kill the mind of the flesh. I just gave you number one. How do you kill the flesh? What is the first step to spiritual homicide? You have to renew your mind. You have to kill the mind of your flesh. Right. Flesh has its own way of thinking. Flesh rationalizes things. Flesh tries to figure things out logically. Flesh. Um, doesn't understand how um, God can go to send a prophet to a widow woman who's in debt and has one bottle of oil and uh, she's in debt and then the prophet tells her to borrow. It don't make sense. Flesh tries to rationalize it. Why am I borrowing, borrowing more stuff when I'm already in debt? But flesh don't understand that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher in our ways and you can be in debt with one pot of oil and God will tell you to borrow and then he'll fill all your vessels again alright but um, let's get off of that so the carnal mind you have to kill that carnal mind and the way you kill it is you renew your mind alright you you see every thought need a bouncer uh, some of y'all used to go to the club and outside the club, they had bouncers, all right? And a bouncer made sure if, if whoever they wanted to kick out the club, the bouncer was responsible for it. Whoever they didn't want to let in the club, the bouncer was responsible for it, all right? So the club is your mind, and the bouncer is the Holy Ghost. So your thoughts need a bouncer. You have to screen all of your thoughts through the Word of God. All right, you have to screen everything you think. See the deception of the devil. If the devil can get you to think that everything you think originates from you, you're already deceived. All of your thoughts do not originate from you. All right, that's real deep right there. But the enemy's job is to get his voice to sound like your mind. All right, the devil doesn't sound like how the devil sounds in the movies. All right. He sounds like your own mind. He sounds like your own voice. All right. And until you renew your mind, your flesh will control you. Now, let's um, let's just go to another thing. Um, so you got the mind of the flesh. That's how you think. You got the lust of the flesh. Now, the word lust is not sexual desire. The word lust means strong desire. All right. I keep getting all these notifications. The word lust means strong desire. All right. So your flesh has lust. Now go to Galatians 5. Oh, we already in Galatians 5. But let's jump up to verse. Where is it? Holy Ghost. Let's jump up to verse 17. All right. We started at verse 19. Let's jump up to verse 17. So you have the mind of the flesh, Romans 8 and 5. You have the lust of the flesh, Galatians 
5 and 17. All right. Um, 5 and 16 and 17. And you have the works of the flesh, which is Galatians 5 and 19. And we fail living in the spirit because we try to live holy by avoiding the works of the flesh. And you cannot do that. All right. The first thing you have to do to kill your flesh is you have to renew your mind. You got to kill the mind of the flesh. You have to get into the mind of God. And the only way you can do that, you have to get in this Bible. All right. And you don't read the Bible to like a coloring book like that. All right. So my Bible looks like a coloring book. Highlights all kind of stuff. So um, good morning, um, whoever that is. Um, so you got to kill. Now let's deal with the lust of the flesh. All right. Because that's the second area of the carnal nature you have to attack in order to learn how to walk in the spirit and die to the flesh. All right. What is that? That's Galatians 5 and 17. Now watch this. It says, For the flesh lust against the spirit, and the spirit lust against the flesh. And these are contrary. What does that mean? The flesh and the spirit is always in a tug of war. It's always a battle. It's always a pull. All right. That's why you have to learn how to die to the flesh. All right. Or you find yourself in a work of the flesh and then you beat yourself up because you're trying to stop your actions without renewing your mind and without uh, renewing your desire for God. All right. Which I just gave you insight into the, the second key to spiritual homicide. The second step to, to spiritual homicide is to develop a hunger after the things of God. All right, so the first one is to renew your mind. The second one is to develop a hunger after the things of God. You can get so caught up in the spirit, you don't have time to sin. It's a reality. It's a truth. Jude 24, he is able to keep you from following. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, with every temptation, he makes a way of his escape. So it's not God help me. It's you make a decision that you want to do right. All right. Everything you think you don't have just because you think it doesn't mean you have to do it just because you feel it doesn't mean you have to do it. It says if you walk in the spirit of uh, first Corinthians, I mean, uh, Galatians 5 and 16, it says if you walk in the spirit, you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does that mean? I like to say it like this. Uh, you do not have to fulfill what you feel. All right, flesh is going to have desires, it's going to have appetites, it's going to have cravings. But just because you feel it doesn't mean you need to fulfill it. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh if you walk in the spirit. But you have to develop verse 17 of the text, which it says the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit lusteth against the flesh. What does that mean? Remember, lust is not sexual desire. It means strong desire. What does that mean? Your flesh comes with strong desire. But in the same extent, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost comes with holy desire. Holy Ghost equals holy desire. So when the Spirit of God takes residence in you, it comes he comes with a desire after God that you did not have before you were saved. All right. You just have to learn how to cultivate that desire. Because remember, the verse says your flesh desires is constantly at war with your natural desires. I mean, with your spiritual desires and your spiritual desires are constantly at war with your fleshly desires. The only way to uh, Deal with it is you have to cultivate your spiritual desires. All right. So now we learn and um, let me read this scripture right here in John chapter 15, verse 26. One of the jobs of the Holy Ghost when he comes is to make Jesus real to you. All right. And not only does he make Jesus real, but he gives you more of a desire for Jesus. That's Jesus talking in John chapter 15. When he comes, the spirit of truth, he will testify of me. That's Jesus talking. So the, the job of the Holy Ghost is to point you to Jesus. 
All right. So that's what happens when he comes. He points you to Jesus. He gives you that desire. And that's what lands you in Galatians 5 and 17. The spirit lust against the flesh. When you have the Holy Ghost, he has a desire against the desires of the flesh. You don't want to do wrong. You don't want to fornicate. You don't want to sin. Now, so many people, now people who not really say they just go to church and try to find out how much they can do and get by with and still make it into heaven. They ain't say, all right, that ain't, that ain't salvation. Salvation comes with a desire that you don't want to sin anymore. You don't want to do wrong anymore. You don't want to hurt God. You don't want to, to disappoint him. All right. That's what the Holy Ghost comes in our lives for. That's one of the reasons that he comes. And now it says that Galatians 5 and 17 for this flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. They're constantly at war. They're constantly fighting each other. Why? So that you cannot do the things that you would. You see that? If you follow the desires of your flesh, you will not do what the spirit wants you to do. But if you follow the desires of your spirit, you will not do what your flesh wants you to do. That's Bible. That's scripture. So the problem with the flesh is not that everyone makes mistakes. Everyone, no one's perfect. That's not the problem. That's a given. Everyone knows that. Without the Spirit of God, I, I say it again, we are all a bunch of animals. That's what the flesh is. It's the animal nature. It's those appetites of your body going wild and dominating your soul. Remember what your soul was? Your soul is, I want, I, uh, I want, I feel, what was it? And I think. So your flesh begins to dominate your, your, um, your mentality. That's the carnal mind. Then your flesh begins to dominate your appetites. All right? That's the lust of the flesh. And then your flesh begins to dominate your actions. So you have to get so strong in the spirit that your spirit begins to dominate your soul again. You tell your body what to do. All right? Your body doesn't tell you what to do. So a lot of this stuff is not God help me. It's a decision. It's a decision that every disciple has to make. All right. Um, let's go deeper. Y'all want to go deeper? Y'all want to go deeper? All right. Want to go deeper? It's a choice. Yes, it's a choice. All right. Now, I'm not saying this to um, somebody said responsibility. I'm glad you said that. I got to read this. This is what the Holy Ghost told me this morning. He said, um, there is a place beyond feelings called responsibility. Now that's deep. I'm going to say it again. There is a place beyond feelings called responsibility. And that's good right there. Because some of us, you know, anything... We feel like doing anything we desire. We just give into it. That's not discipline. That's not responsibility. So part of being a spiritual person is taking responsibilities for your actions. All right. It's not about beating yourself up because you find yourself in sin. All right. It's about realizing the cause of that sin, the iniquity. All right. The underlying cause of that sin. What is it that I want? That's leading me into this sin. What is it that I'm thinking that's leading me into this sin? It's not about trying to do better. It's about renewing your mind and developing a hunger after the things of the spirit. Because the only way you can kill the flesh is by um, following and walking in the spirit. You have to get in the spirit. You have to get in the spirit. All right. So um, is this good? You said, where is that at? I need to not forget that. Where is what at? A place beyond. No, that's what the Holy Ghost spoke to me. Dealing with discipline. All right. That's not a verse. That's not a scripture. All right. So, now I'm about, I'm, I'm about to help you. I'm about to hope you. 
This is going to bless you. This is going to bless you. So, um, let me get deeper into this. So, the mind of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. I'm looking at some of my notes now. The next scripture we're going to go to, I'm going to be on about 15 more minutes, is um, Romans 8. Romans 8, and we're going to start at verse 5. I'm going to break this down, all right, and show you how to go about this spiritual homicide mission, how to kill this flesh. You got it? Romans 8, verse 5. Romans 8, verse 5. I'm still turning. Because I'm turning and I keep stopping because the Holy Ghost. I, I have a whole I have a whole teaching on fasting, yes. See people people be let me just take a pause and then we'll get back to this. Um, you know, some people are like you teach so much on Periscope, you're gonna give away all your sermons. I am not I have not even went through ten percent of my reservoir. All right, there's a lot more where this came from. See, when people were not calling me to preach when I didn't have preaching engagements, I was praying, fasting and reading the word. I come from a strong teaching church. It was an apostolic church, so it, you know they love to praise God and they love to, um, they love to you know be excited about God. But it was a strong teaching church, so uh, we really got in the Word. So I would study the Bible for hours, hours, hours. I would study, do word studies, and you know I really jumped into this Word. So that's why I love Periscope because I can just teach and teach and. We can archive these teachings, and if I ever teach something else or someone needs a foundation, I can say, well, just go back to this teaching that I taught called this from last year or something. So I'm going to be teaching as much as possible, and I promise, as much as you all keep, as much as you all keep wanting this, um, the Holy Ghost in me is going to keep giving it, because I'm not going to run out of word. Um, it's just not going to happen. So... Um, to answer your question, yes, I do have a teaching on fasting. I never taught it either. I have an old journal from 2004, pages full of scriptures on fasting from generation from Genesis to Revelations, and um, I believe in fasting and consecration. So I studied it out. Over 21 benefits of fasting, probably probably more than that. Um, how did God provide for me in that season? I was broke. And he gave seed to the sore. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a car. Um, I barely had enough money to get my hair cut and eat. So um, he gave seed to the sore. I don't I don't remember how. I started sowing a $100 seed. I don't remember where I was getting. No, I was doing it while I was working. All right. That was FedEx. But it still wasn't enough to live off of. So I was still considered to live in poverty. All right. I was working at FedEx. Then when I left my job volunteering um, in ministry full time, all of my needs were taken care of when I was on the road. But someone had to take me in. I just don't want to stay with my parents anymore. Um, and um, I'm going to get back to the teaching. I just heard someone in the spirit saying, please finish teaching. I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to get back to the teaching. You can watch the replay if you need to. And um, I started sowing that hundred dollar seed once a month. Then I started sowing it a couple of times a month because I figured, well, I can't live off of this anyway. So I started sowing it until I got to the place where God said, okay, he's a source. I'm going to give him seed. I don't remember where it came from, but I sowed my first $1,000 seed, $1,000 lump sum, 2008, the month of June, to Benahan Ministries, and I had $8 left in my account. And I was not sad about it. I was so happy. I was the first person then in my family. And that's when I began to see breakthrough. Less than 30 days, um, less than 30 days after I sold that first 1000 I had a wealthy couple, both of them in business, both of them own their own company from out of state, started sending me a minimum of $1,000 a month. All right. And I kept sowing those seeds, but I still couldn't live off that. But um, they began to bless my life, and I was able to get my second car because my first car was given to me because I trusted God. And I sought the kingdom first and the righteousness. This is all these things that be added. And uh, someone gave me my first car. I gave it away because I was traveling so much, and one of my mother's friends needed it. A member in the church who was on my ministry staff as well. So I gave it a car, and I thought I was going to get a car really quick. 
But it wasn't until I sold my first thousand dollar seed that the income came in when I was able to buy um, my first car. And I kept sowing those seeds um, multiple times. I remember one time I sold the thousand dollar seed on my birthday. Now I'm still just got a car, still don't have a place to live. I'm still rooming with people, all right, because I don't want to live with my parents. Still, you know, still not seeing all the results. And then I sold another thousand dollar seed uh, around Christmas. See, a lot of carnal people could never do that. Um, but I was serious about this thing. And then I kept sowing. I kept sowing that thousand dollar seed. I don't remember how I kept getting it. All I know is Second Corinthians nine. He gives seed to the sower, and I kept sowing them. All right, because if it cannot meet your need, it is your seed. So um, someone needs to hear this. So just let me keep saying it. And um, even with my wife, when we married, and uh, when we met in two thousand nine, we married on the day we met. 2012, three years later, we met March the 7th, 2009. We married March the 7th, 2012, when I discovered that my wife, a year before we met, both of us had sold our first $1,000 seed in the heat of our poverty the same year. And I always say sometimes your seed is what God will use to keep you from marrying into poverty. So when I married my wife, she already had the capacity for me to keep seeking God at the level I was seeking God on because she was seeking God on that same level. And she was believing God for financial breakthrough, spiritual breakthrough, and we had begun to see it. So uh, even when we first married in 2012, we began sowing that thousand dollar seed. Uh, we, weren't even, we weren't even married three months. And we started sowing that thousand dollar seed every month for a season by the word of the Lord. And we began to see God do things in our income, triple it, double it, and um, and led us up to where we are now. So fasting, prayer, and giving. There are three disciplines that Jesus taught if you do them secretly. Now, I can tell my testimony now, but when I was doing that stuff, no one would have ever looked at me. I was sowing more than people who were making eight times of what I was making. I was giving more than they were giving. You think God wasn't going to honor that? All right. So the Lord told me, he said, do not make excuses for people. He said, I don't care if they're with minimum wage. I had no guaranteed income. And I was sowing that $1,000 seed on a regular. All right. And um, God was giving me seed for it. All right. The Bible says he will give seed to the sower. So the Lord said, don't make excuses. He said, I don't care if they're on minimum wage. I don't care if you're below poverty. Listen, I don't care if you got to sell your food stamps. There's something that happens when you break into the thousand. All right. If you can't sell the thousand, start sowing a hundred. But there are three things that Jesus taught. If you do them secretly, he will reward you openly. Those three things are praying, fasting and giving. All right. They bring an open reward. And I put all of them together. All right. So people looked at me and uh, the people that were I was bombing rides with. Now they want to drive what I drive. The people that uh, I was borrowing money for, now they need what I got. So um, my giving, you, I make my living by my giving. All right. You make your living by your giving. So um, it works. I'm telling you. Sowing, fasting, praying, it works. My wife met me. I was on the 30th day of a 40-day liquid fast. Liquid fast. I looked like I was over in Africa somewhere. She was not interested in me at all because I had a fasted lifestyle and I was sowing them thousand dollar seeds and I had a prayer life where uh, there's a season in my life where I committed to seven hours of prayer Monday through Friday. All right. So this stuff works. All right. But you got to get out of the flesh and get into the spirit and start seeking God. Right, the Bible says he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God's not just concerned about your spiritual life. He's concerned about your natural life. You just got to cross over. You got to get to that place where you say, I want to pursue God and I'll do whatever it takes to get in the place in God where I need to be. You got to bring your thoughts under subjection. Renew your mind. Uh, bring your appetites and your feelings and your emotions under subjection. Tell that flesh to die and start seeking God with all your heart. It pays off. I'm telling you. He said, Jesus said, there's no man that has left house, car, or given up anything that will uh, not receive a hundredfold. Watch this. Not only 
in the world to come, but in this world also. Your reward is not waiting on you in heaven. Now, there are rewards for you in heaven, but there are some rewards God want to get to you now. And if you seek the kingdom first, make it priority. Do it with all of your focus. Cut out the distractions. Get rid of the people around you that's not going in the same direction. I can't tell you how many friends I've lost over the years. All right. We didn't fall out. I didn't burn bridges. I just sought God so hard that it moved me into another class. That's a oh, oh God. Now that was a word right there. So um, make up in your mind and stop getting discouraged. Stop getting discouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Every blessing is not overnight. Now, I prophesy overnight stuff, and it happened for people. I, I, I'm in services, and the Lord tells me 72 hours, and, and stuff happened quick for people. But do you know how much I labored? Do you know the years I labored? While people were getting blessed immediately, I was being patient. Are you hearing this? So we were sowing them $1,000 seeds. We didn't see it immediate. We're just now seeing some of the harvest of seeds that we sold. Them $1,000 seeds we sold every month. We're just now seeing three years later some of the harvest of those seeds. We didn't get discouraged. We believed in the process. See, I didn't have nothing. I didn't have a plan B. And that's what's wrong with some of you. You have a, you have a second option. You got to get out there spiritual crutch. You cannot have a plan B. Either God works. He says, for God I live or for God I die. Either God works for you or nothing works for you. All right? You got to decide. You're going to trust God with all of your heart. And you're going to keep going. Listen, if you're not Noah and you don't have to build an ark for 120 years without the evidence of rain, then you ain't waited long enough. If you're not Abraham and you got to wait 25 years until you can uh, impregnate your wife with your promised child, then you haven't waited. You don't have anything to complain about. Those promises God made to those patriarchs, they would wait years. Noah built for 120 years. Abraham waited for 25 years. And we get depressed because we don't see a miracle in two days. You, know, you got to come off that. That's flesh. That's unstable. All right. You got to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You got to get some strength in your spirit. And you got to see there is never a no to prayer. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Everything that's been prophesied to you, everything this word says, the answer is already yes. You already have clearance from heaven to receive your breakthrough. All right. You got to stop giving up on God. You give up too early. You quit too early. We're in this microwave generation. We want everything quick. We want to jump in the prophecy line. We want someone to lay hands on us. Uh, Throw pixie dust on us, pull a rabbit out the hat, and then spin around three times and everything is okay. No, those who live righteously will suffer persecution. After you have suffered a while, then he will establish you and perfect you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them from them all. Now, listen, I suffered. Some people say, well, that, that, that boy looks young. Listen, I suffered for years. And there's still things. We have to suffer. All right. So get some patience about yourself. Strengthen your spirit. Paul said, be strengthened in your inner man with might. He said, I pray that you be strengthened in your. You got to be able to go through something. You can't just keep tapping out. All right. Stop tapping out. Every time the Bible says that when you receive a word, that persecution will come because of the word. So when you receive a prophecy, when you receive a promise, that is the devil's cue to cause all hell to break loose. All right. That's his cue. All right. So when you get a promise and then your life starts going the opposite of the promise, that means you're going the right direction. That doesn't mean something's wrong. Stop giving up on God. Stop uh, giving up on prayer. You give up too easy. You want it too fast. All right. And sometimes the pressure, sometimes the trial is building our character. And it's building us to the place where we can handle the blessing. Bishop Jakes preached a message called, Can You Stand to Be Blessed? Some of us, the blessing is so heavy, but our, our strength is too weak and we'll crumble under the blessing. The blessing will break us. Will the blessing break you or will it make you? All right. So uh, some of us can't stand to be blessed. All right. Remember Saul? Remember Saul? Remember Saul? He got the kingdom and then he lost.
lost the kingdom because God gave it to David. And what happened? When he got the kingdom and he when he lost the kingdom, he kept the stuff that came with the kingdom and a demon that was assigned to the stuff got assigned to Saul. And the only person that can get the demon off of Saul was the person that had the kingdom. That's why it says seek the kingdom first and then all these other things shall be added. See, if you get the stuff before you get the kingdom, then you get the demon that come with the stuff. But if you get the kingdom, then you get the stuff that come with the kingdom. All right. So um, can you stand to be blessed? Can God trust you with a million dollars? Some of you, if you got a million dollars today, you wouldn't even pay your tithe. How are you going to pay your tithe off a million and you ain't pay your tithe off a thousand? That's flesh. All right. So flesh tries to use God as a genie in a lamp. All right. But um, you got to you got to you got to build yourself up. Now, let's get back to this word. I don't know. I don't know how I got there. But um, hallelujah. He's speaking. All right. Hallelujah. Come on. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Uh, Glory Jesus Hallelujah We feel your anointing We thank you for your presence We reverence you We bless you King of kings Lord of lords Ruler of the nations Desire of the nations Alpha Omega Beginning and ending First last Which was and is And is to come You You decree the end from the beginning The alpha the omega The beginning and the ending We thank you for who you are. We bless you. Thank you for strengthening their spirits. Thank you for uh, increasing their patience. There's someone, and this may sound simple, but the anointing just came on you not to give up. Some of you were at the door of your breakthrough and you gave up. It says, be not weary and well doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. Just hang on. Just stay in there. Don't give up so easy. Right? So I don't even know how I can finish this, but I gave you three. I guess I'll stop right there. So the issue is not everyone makes mistakes. No one's perfect. See, temptation doesn't start with a mistake. Sin doesn't start with a mistake. It starts with a thought. James 1 verse 14, it says, every man when he's tempted, he's um, drawn out by his own lust and enticed. You see that word enticed? That word entice in the Greek, it also means to be deluded. Excuse me. You see it? There it is. Temptation begins with a thought. So he's enticed. And then when lust is conceived, so it starts as a thought, then it becomes a desire. Then it conceives to sin. And then sin conceives death. That's James 1 and 14. So, um... So it's not about not being perfect. It's, it's, um, it's the evolution of an ungodly thought. That thought comes to maturity and then it burps. That's why you got to start killing the flesh at your mind. Then you got to deal with your desires, begin to develop a hunger after God. All right. That's how you do it. If you walk in the spirit, Galatians 5 and 16, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now let's go to Romans 8. Before we get off of here. Yeah, the battle of the mind is something. Yeah. So, um, there's so much I want to deal with. I wrote so many notes, I'm not getting there. I'm not going to stay on here too long. Oh, the third is being led by the Spirit. All right, it says, the, those who are led by the Spirit. All right. Those who are led by the Spirit. And those who walk in the Spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Alright, so the works of the flesh, those are actions. Alright, so the more you you um, go after God and develop that desire after His presence, and the more He's going to lead you and navigate your life, and the more you obey the leading of the Spirit. Listen, I said this earlier, you can get so in the Spirit, you don't have time to sin. Alright, I know a lot of people don't believe that, but it's Bible. You can get so in the spirit, you don't have time to sin. All right. So the more you follow the leading of the spirit, all right, um, the less time you're going to have for the works of the flesh. Now, look, when it dealt with the works of the flesh, which are sinful actions, it dealt with it in context 
of the fruit of the Spirit. So when you're being led by the Spirit, the result is the fruit of it is going to be, um, you're going to be more like Jesus. All right? So you're going to have less space for the works of the flesh because you're being led by the Spirit. Instead of adultery, you're going to have patience. Instead of fornication, you're going to have meekness. Instead of idolatry, you're going to have uh, temperance. Instead of, uh, just look at the list of the fruit of the Spirit. That Those are the results of being led by the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. And remember, it says if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you got to get in that Word, renew your mind, all right? See, being in the Word and being in the Spirit is like a car having gas, all right? So when your car runs out of gas, is that sin, all right? And a lot of people, we get all surprised when we sin, but when's the last time you fill up your gas tank? When's the last time you fill up your spiritual gas tank? When's the last time you got in the Word? When's the last time you sought after God? When you are not in the Word and when you are not in the Spirit, you are vulnerable to the flesh. The only way to deal with the flesh is to get in the Spirit. That's the only way. Not trying to do better. Well, I'm going to do better next time. See, your, 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 the works of the flesh are like the indicator lights on your car that your, your car is about to break down. All right, so by the time you fornicate, by the time you commit adultery, there's some stuff that's been going on behind the scenes in your mind and in your desires that have cultivated to a maturity, and now the works of the flesh are made manifest. Galatians 5 and 19. Does it make more sense now? Now the works of the flesh are made manifest. Why? Right, because you were in the flesh of your mind. You were in the, the lust of your flesh. And the more you let yourself desire that and you paid attention to those desires, uh, and the more you, you, uh, you gave yourself to those thoughts and didn't renew your mind, now the works of the flesh are made manifest. All right? So um, you got to renew your mind. You got to Colossians chapter 3, I think it's verse 1 and 2. You got to set your affection on things above. You got to develop a lust after the spirit. Remember, lust is not sexual sin. Lust is strong desire. You got to lust. The word lust in the Greek is the same word where it says covet spiritually, uh, covet to prophesy, covet spiritual gifts, desire earnestly. Let me do an interjection. A lot of people are asking. Oh, come on. So, um, so they can go to our website and send us an email, and then we can send them the PayPal link. Oh, people ask. I didn't even see. My mom said people are asking how to sew. Hi y'all, yeah, if you want to sew, us. we don't have it connected to our website yet, but if you want to sew, go to Ferguson, and we'll send you a link, we'll send you a link, go to Ferguson's, don't forget the S, global.com, Ferguson's with an S, global.com, and when you email us, we'll send you the PayPal link, All right? Yeah, or you can go to our email, admin at ferguson'sglobal.com, and we'll send you a link. Don't forget the S, Ferguson's plural. I'm so many teaching on. So excuse me, um, I didn't see you all commenting. Yeah, Ferguson's Global. Thank you, Gina. Um, and do can you do the email as well? Admin at Ferguson's Ferguson's Global dot com. Put that email up there. Comment it about seven times so people can see it. And y'all watch for the email. Admin at Ferguson's Global dot com. Just email us, say, hey, we would like to sow into the ministry. And we'll send you a link where you can sow it to the ministry. But we are getting a new website. As soon as I get off of this and my wife gets on for her girl talk, and I'm going to be talking to a um, website uh, company about our new website. And it could be up as soon as seven days. So we will have it at our website soon. Uh, we'll get there. But I hope you all are enjoying this. There it is, admin. Y'all just keep commenting that and um, so people can see it. Just keep, keep commenting that. And you send us an email. Say, I, I would like to sow into the ministry. And we'll send you a link where you can do that. Amen. So, um, what was I saying? I think that's good. But write these scriptures down. Romans 6 and 12. It says you do not have to. You do not have to. Um. Let sin reign in your body to obey its lust. So just because you feel it doesn't mean you have to do it. All right. You can control your fleshly appetites. All right. So um, um, write this down. Galatians 5 and 16. 
Am I going too long? Y'all want some more? Am I going some more? I mean, am I going too long? Or can you stomach some more? Because I never got the Romans 8 and 5. I can do this in 10 minutes. I can do this in two minutes. I saw someone, I saw that comment about the serpent. That's good. I used to teach that. Uh, someone, something about DC came up. Someone asked about DC. Something about DC came up last week. I got to go back and check about DC. But I should be coming to that area very soon. Um, I should be coming to that area very soon. So, so far, um, to spiritual homicide, you got to kill the mind of the flesh. How, how do you do that? You have to renew your mind. All right. That's Romans 12, verse 1 through 2. Um, spiritual homicide, how do you do that? The second thing you have to do, you have to develop a hunger for God. That's Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, set your affection on things above. So you're cultivating that desire that the Bible says the Spirit of God comes with. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive a desire for holy things. Right? And that's Galatians 5. I've been saying it over and over again. Galatians 5 and 17. It says, the Spirit lusts against the flesh. The Spirit has strong desires that oppose the desires of the flesh. Right? So the more you cultivate your hunger for God, the more um, you will kill those desires for the flesh. And that's Bible. All right. You can broadcast on PlayStation 4. That's pretty good. So um, let me see. Let's go to Romans 8. This is going to bless you. And then number three, spiritual homicide. How do you do it? You obey the leading of the Holy Ghost. You walk in the Spirit. Because when you're in the Spirit, you don't have time. Remember, that's Galatians 5 and 16. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's a strong statement. We got to believe that. We have to believe that. All right. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I haven't gotten an invitation for Virginia Beach yet. But I'm sure it's coming. Um, let's go to Romans 8. You ready? Let's start at verse 5. I'm going to merge Romans 8 with Romans 12 and Galatians 5. And it's a mind-blowing revelation here that you're going to see that's going to help you. All right? So, um, spiritual homicide. Is this good or what? I need some heart amen. Let's take a heart praise break. Come on, put them hearts up. Let's take a heart praise break. I want to see some more colors. I, I know my spirit in my belly all morning. I've been um, feeling a strong witness to do this. So I'm still going to do the prophetic class, maybe. I figure it out. If you all put a demand on it, if you post on my wall and tweet me and all that kind of stuff, then I'll do it. If I don't see that many people posting and tweeting, then I'll just wait till tomorrow. All right? Because I'm pouring out a lot. Now, I, I can pour out till I'm blue in the face, but I don't want to over, I don't want to overdo it. I only want to do it to the level of your demand. All right? And if you feel like you're just getting stuffed in the spirit, that is good. The only way you can grow is by overfeeding. All right, so you got to eat really good. Eat this good spiritual meat and go ahead and grow up in the Holy Ghost. So um, I was talking about James before I went to Romans 8. I'm looking at some, I'm looking at some uh, comments really quick. Someone said, yes, don't waste the oil. And we got oil. We don't have a lack of oil. Our oil is full. We don't have a lack of oil at all. So we can teach, we can teach, we can teach, and we can prophesy, and we can teach, and prophesy, and prophesy, and prophesy. She said, finish this today, go back to the prophetic tomorrow. Okay, I may consider that. I just want to hear your, I want to hear your preference, and whoever wins will determine. 
So um, I'll look at your post on Facebook and I'll look at your tweets and I'll determine whether I come back and do the prophetic today or whether I wait until tomorrow. But I'm gonna do. A, I'm gonna start doing a lot more teaching. All right. Sometimes a couple of times a day, just so I can archive it, because there's so much revelation in me. Um, someone said, "Do the prophetic tonight." Someone said, "I want it all. I'm greedy. I missed something about God's voice." Now we've been talking about God's voice, so whatever that was, you got to catch up to speed. You got to go to YouTube. Uh, Gina has been posting videos on YouTube. And uh, you can type in my name and see them. We've been dealing a whole, whole lot with hearing the voice of God. So that's why I'm teaching so much. So when people have questions and I see the comments, I can say, hey, well, go watch this video. Or go watch this video. Or go watch this video. I already talked about that. Go watch this video. All right. And then remember, um, email us if you want to sign up for the uh, video uh, teachings in your email. We're going to eventually start sending these teachings to your email, but you have to sign up for it. All right. Uh, um, Romans 8. I'm just going to read some of my notes until I get to Romans 8. All right. Email me. That's how you sign up. Um, or go look on my Twitter and uh, you'll see a link where you can sign up for the emails in one of my recent tweets. Someone said you signed up yesterday. Well, bless you. Someone said he can teach it, but we have to digest it and put it to work. That's right. All right. The way you do it is to begin to cultivate a life in the spirit. Get in the word. And cultivate your hunger for God. And whatever the Holy Ghost leads you to do, do it. All right? Whatever He puts in your spirit, whatever He, however He leads you, follow His directions. And when you walk in the Spirit, you automatically die to the flesh. That's how you do it. It's not about trying to live better. It's not about trying to do better. All right? It's about killing that old nature. And the only way to kill it is by getting in the Spirit. All right? Yes, digested. This is good. I'm glad you all enjoying this. It's just so much. Jesus is so much. All right. So I dealt with temptation, how it begins with a thought. Then it becomes a lust or a strong desire. And then you act out that desire, which is sin. That's James 1 and 14. So temptation begins with a thought. So every thought is not your thought. We, we, we dealt with that. You got to teach your mind how to think. We dealt with that. You got to bring strongholds, pull down strongholds. And what is what, what is pulling down strongholds is not some type of spiritual warfare prayer. Pulling down strongholds is bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. All right. So just because you think it doesn't mean you have to act on it. All right. You got to bring those thoughts into subjection. All right, and then we dealt with the lust of the flesh, and that's where we are now. The lust of the flesh. This is what the flesh wants when it wants it. And the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and 12, we do not have to obey the lust of our flesh. So just because we feel it does not mean we have to act on it. All right, we can bring it under subjection. And the more we cultivate the lust of the spirit, we will begin to bring the lust of the flesh under subjection. All right. That's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So just because you feel it does not mean you have to do it. You do not have to fulfill what you feel. It says they who walk in the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right. So you take up your cross daily. Jesus said, Paul said, I die daily. Paul also said, I buffet myself unless I, uh, after preaching the word, I become a castaway. So no one's exempt from dying to the flesh. All right, it don't matter how spiritual you are. Every day you wake up, the flesh wakes up with you. All right, so the way you kill the lust of the flesh is by setting your affection on things above. You have to develop a spiritual hunger. That's Colossians three and two. All right. So, and the last one, the remedy for the flesh, is um, 
life in the spirit. It says in Romans 8 and 13 that we by the spirit mortify the deeds of the body and we live. So as we're led by the spirit, um, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh and um, we will begin to see the fruit of being led by the Spirit in our lives. We'll become more like Jesus. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, patience, all those, temperance, goodness, meekness, you know, nine of them right there in Galatians 5. Go read it for homework. Now, let's conclude this in Romans 8. Keep them hearts going. Keep them hearts going. We in class right now. Amen. You are. Romans 8 and 5. And this is going to blow your mind. This is some good teaching. So, Romans 8 and 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You see that? But they that are after the spirit, the things of the mind. What the things of the mind? They mind the things of the Spirit. I'm sorry, not the things of the mind, but the things of the Spirit. Let's read it again. For they that are after, that we're after is very key. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So the way you know that you're in the flesh is not, are you fornicating? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you sinning? Remember, by the time you get to the works of the flesh, it's already too late. They've already manifest. That that means that ungodly thought has evolved and that sin has conceived and come to a maturity. And the reason you are sinning is because um, that sin has evolved in your heart first. All right. It started in a the thought then it became a desire. And then you begin to pursue that desire and then you acted on that desire and then you became a sin. So by the time you sin, it ain't time to be. Feeling all sorry about yourself. Now, godly sorrow worketh repentance, but it is not repentance. All right. So when you finish feeling sorry about yourself, make sure you repent. All right. Repent means to change your mind first. Uh, it's repent. Pent means high place. Re means go back. So go back to a high place. Amen. Uh, it also means to turn. So that's why John the Baptist said, if you have repented, if you have changed your mind and if you have returned to a high place, a higher place of living, then show it by the fruit of your repentance. All right. So repentance is not just mental. It means to change your ways. But you cannot change your ways until you change your mind. Be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, but be ye re-transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right. So if you renew your mind, you will transform your world. So, um, yeah. So... Ah, that was a download right there. Selah. Whew. This is a good word. Renew your mind. All right. So, those that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, Romans 8 and 5. But they that are after the spirit. What does that mean? It means pursuit. Those who pursue the things of the spirit, Romans 5, I mean Romans 8 and 5, keep spiritual things on their mind. That is good work right there. What are you thinking about? What consumes your focus? What is always on your mind? You have to start prioritizing the things of the spirit in your mind. Those who pursue after spiritual things are constantly thinking about spiritual things. Now, somebody says, this is this, this too deep for me to always be thinking about spiritual things. But that's a, there's a deeper place than deep. It's called a bottomless pit. All right. No escape from it. A fire that is never quenched. A worm that never dies. I'd rather be deep now than be deep later. All right. So if that's too deep for you then you know which part of you is alive. And it ain't your spirit, it's your flesh. Alright? So we got to get out of that. We, we got to come on up. You have to develop a pursuit after God. And listen, if your spirit is alive, it is not normal for you to not have a pursuit after Him. 
when you receive the spirit, it comes with a desire that leads you into a pursuit. Why? Because the proof of desire is pursuit. So they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. So what does that mean? It starts with a desire. Then it's a pursuit. And then it's a mentality. It's a focus. It's a priority. It's a mentality. Those who are pursuing spiritual things keep their minds on spiritual things. Think on these things. Whatsoever things are noble. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are right. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. See, the mind is powerful. The mind is powerful. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So when you develop that pursuit, it starts with a desire. I just showed you in Galatians 5 how that when you receive the spirit, Galatians 5 and 17 says the spirit has a set of strong desires. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive desire. Now that desire must become a pursuit. Romans 8 and 5. Those who are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. Now here's the bombshell. The Lord spoke to me. He said, if you really understand this scripture to be after the spirit, to be after the things of the spirit and to mind the things of the spirit. In other words, to have a spiritual mind. All right, to allow your thinking to be filled with spiritual things, not just any spiritual thing, but the Word of God. All right, it, he said, if you really understand that process, then you will understand that it is impossible. I'm about to drop the bone. It is impossible to renew your mind if you have not renewed your desire. Whew. I just said a word. It is impossible to renew your mind and you have not renewed your desire. See, we keep telling people, renew your mind, renew your mind, renew your mind. And a person who does not desire to think about godly things will not desire to renew their mind. So when I renew my desire, when I begin to cultivate that hunger after God, when was the last time you just wanted to be in his presence? When was the last time you just wanted to get in his word to learn more about him? Preachers, not to study for your sermon. When was the last time you wanted to just spend time with him? Develop, cultivate. Listen, if you think prayer is boring, you have not been in the spirit yet. I know a man, he was taken out of his body um, to heaven. Now, I've been out of my body to heaven twice, all right? So I've experienced that. But I did not experience um, the aftermath of what he experienced. He experienced so much of heaven. He, when he came back to earth. Now, it's on the, okay. When he came back to earth, heaven was so, was such an awesome experience to him that he suffered a depression for a whole year. He didn't want to live here no more. I mean, he told me how he began to go to theme parks. He went to every theme park imaginable. And everything he experienced in a theme park, uh, any type of entertainment he tried, it could not compare to heaven. So when people say, well, that just sounds too boring. Well, that just is too much. Well, that just is too deep. Then you haven't really tasted God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You cannot experience God and then uh, exchange Him for something that's earthly. You haven't really experienced Him. You've experienced church. The Lord spoke to me. He said, many people have an indirect relationship with me. They know me through prophecy. They know me through their pastor. They know me through their church. That's why when the pastor backslides, they lead a church. When you, are you hearing me? So, you, do you have an indirect relationship now, do you have a direct connect with heaven? You cannot experience God and be shallow. You cannot experience God and think that what I'm talking about is impossible or well, it's just boring. No, you boring. God ain't boring. Somebody say, well, that's just boring. That's just, no, you boring. 
Listen, you get in the spirit. You get in the spirit. And um, I'm telling you, you have no idea. You have no idea. You get in the spirit and three hours of prayer for like three minutes. You don't want to come out that prayer closet. You get in the spirit then seven hours of prayer for like 15 minutes. So, um, let me end this. So, you have to, let me see this. You cannot renew the mind until there's a renewed desire. The Holy Spirit comes with holy desire. All right. Remember that's Galatians 5 and 16. It says the spirit lust. If you get that revelation, that'll help you. The spirit lust. The Holy Ghost lust. And matter of fact, James go further than that. It says he lusted after you. The Holy Ghost lusts after you. Now that's deep right there. So the problem is not that oh I, I just every time I want to do right I just I just can't help but do wrong. You're letting your flesh lust overpower your spiritual lust. You gotta feed that spiritual lust. Feed it with the word. Feed it with prayer. Feed it in fasting, and it will overpower those fleshly appetites. Feed it every day. And listen, when you have those spiritual experiences, feed it more. Because your flesh doesn't wake up anymore until you come off a high in God. I just said a word right there. Your flesh goes haywire when you come off a high, a high with God. So you got to watch that. Some of y'all get depressed because you, you go shout at church and you come home and fornicate. Because you don't understand how to guard your spiritual life. You got to protect your spiritual life. You got to realize that when... You go up in the spirit like that, your flesh going to come out kicking and screaming. It ain't going to die easy. It's going to come out. So your flesh is going to want to come back alive again. Flesh goes through resurrection every day. So you got to learn how to kill it. So, um, yeah, that's it. You have a desire. The Holy Ghost lust in you. The Holy Ghost in you has a desire after God. You have to feed that, cultivate that. And as you do, that desire will become a pursuit. For they that are after the Spirit do mind the th things of the Spirit. And as you cultivate the desire and begin to pursue the things of God, then you begin to renew your mind. They that are after the Spirit, then they mind the things of the Spirit. Right? Then you begin to renew your mind. All right? Then you begin to get in the word of God. And that's feeding your spirit. All right. And if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So stop getting so surprised when you fornicate and you ain't read the Bible since you was at church Sunday. Stop getting so surprised and you're lying and gossiping and you ain't been in prayer for three weeks. It's, it's, God ain't surprised. He expects it. All right. Your, he expects your flesh to rise up. So you have to learn how to start feeding your spirit. Read that Bible even if you don't understand it. Read, read, go to church, even if you think your pastor's backslidden. Are you hearing me? Get in, live a life in the spirit. Cultivate that desire. Begin to get into the presence of the Lord. Get into some good, get some good worship music. Come off all that uh, black gospel entertainment music. And uh, get into some good hill songs, some Jesus culture. All them people doing all them rips and runs, all they get on my nerves. I can't stand it here all that singing. And all, all those core change is just messing up the presence. Get in some good presence. Get some Jesus culture, some Bethel, get some Carrie Joby, get some people that ain't concerned about all that foolishness and wish they were the next uh, Patty LaBelle um, in the pulpit and um, that's really worshiping God to be in his presence, not uh, singing worship songs to get a Grammy Award. And get, get rid of the, the, the black gospel music industry is backslidden. All right. Backslidden. Some of your favorite singers left the presence of the Lord. And some of them about to lose a position, I prophesy. And God going to raise up some Davids. So uh, get in the real presence. Get some good worship music. And um, 
Get some good worship music. Lay in the presence of the Lord. Spend some time with Him. Feed your spirit. And if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's good. Now my batteries are low. I got one battery left. I've been, and look at my tools I used to. This is my pad. This is the one I use. Messed it up. So I can't prepare. This is my old Bible. It ain't even got a back on it no more. If anyone want to donate to my Bible ministry, um, email me. I'm going to get this Bible rebound because it got all kind of highlights in it. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What am I doing? How do I turn this thing on? Okay. So, um, any questions? And then I'm gone. Mm-hmm. It's King James. That's the best study Bible. I read every translation. But King James is the best for word study. All right. Put your phone on the charger. No, that means I've been on too long. See, if it wasn't for my charger, then I'd stay on it for four hours. So my charger is my alarm saying, get off of Periscope. So, uh, how do we encourage others to want to desire? Well, just encourage them to cultivate that desire. All right. But you can't give them the desire. The revelation is the spirit lust against the flesh. Galatians 5 and 17. That's the revelation. You have to embrace that. And if you begin to introduce people to the spirit of God, then the spirit of God will cultivate a desire in them. All right. So that's the answer to that question. Yeah, the highlights mean things are sending out to me. Yeah. Sometimes I can read one verse and I get revelation of one word. I do a word study. and um, But you know, any uh, revelation outside of context is pretext. So, you know, when I got into all these word studies and these highlights and stuff with certain phrases, I came from a deep foundation of teaching. All right, revelation without teaching will lead to a spirit of error. You never read the Bible just to get something good out of it. All right, learn the history, learn the culture, learn the, the culture of the time and the context of the chapter. When you read a verse, it's in context of that chapter. That chapter is in context of that book. All right, so you really can't understand any just one verse in the Bible until you really understand the context of that whole book where that verse originated. All right, that's for me the Holy Ghost. Is to speak against the Holy Ghost and call the work of the Holy Ghost evil. Someone asks, what is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? And the reason that it cannot be forgiven is that by the time you blaspheme, you don't want to be forgiven. See, when Jesus uh, talked about blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and that, that it wouldn't be forgiven, he was talking about the Pharisees and they knew it was the Holy Ghost. But because of their status, because of their reputation, they called it the devil, even though they knew it was the Holy Ghost because they didn't want to acknowledge that it was God. All right. So you don't have, I used the word, Lord, have I blasphemed the Holy Ghost? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, listen, the only way you can blaspheme the Holy Ghost is that you don't want to be forgiven. So that's how religious people get. They get to the place that they don't want to change. All right. And um, so if you say, well, Lord, have I blasphemed? If you, if you say, Lord, have I blasphemed, there's a good chance you have not. All right. So um, I'm not going to teach you on fasting and prayer right now. What if you don't remember verses after reading the Bible? It ain't about what you um, remember. All right. This ain't Sunday school. It's the kingdom of God. So uh, it's not about memory verses. It's about feeding your spirit with the, with the word. Um, I used to do prophetic activations a lot. I used to bring like 10 prophets and uh, we, would all, we would prophesy to everybody in the room. I'm going to start back doing that with proven prophets. All right, People that go through training. Uh, people today, they just pop up and want to have a title and a name. And they want to have influence because they want to be seen. But they have no authorization from heaven to have any type of influence. All right. And um, 
So I'm very careful now what prophets I endorse. So prophets come to me all the time. People are called to be prophets. And um, I, I, I send them through it. I ignore them. I, you know, because if you're going to be trained in the prophetic, you have to be able to deal with rejection. All right. So I let people prove themselves. Uh, because a lot of times people, they don't want to be trained. They just want to jump on the bandwagon and they want to start their ministries. So uh, what's another question? You either find someone to tithe until you uh, find a church home. The tithe belongs to God. Whoever asked that question. I'm looking for other questions. You've been trained but not activated but still in training. Yes, yeah, stay in training. Just because you get activated don't mean you've been inaugurated. Heaven has to inaugurate you. Heaven has to release you and commission you and send you out. All right, Only God can do that. Man can't do it. And the license and the ordination papers cannot do that. God has to do that. Any more questions? Yeah, if you're dealing with the prophet, if you're dealing with the prophetic and you're called to the prophetic, you have to deal with rejection. All right, you, you, you have to um, get delivered from it. Transgression versus iniquity. Okay, iniquity is an inner fault. Um, someone said, what's the difference between transgression and iniquity? Iniquity is an inner fault. All right? Uh, it means to bend is what causes you to sin. All right? And when David talked about how God dealt with transgressions versus iniquity, he said, Lord, wash me thoroughly of my iniquity. No, he said, purge me thoroughly of my iniquity. And the word thoroughly means repeatedly. So iniquity... Um, it goes through a purging process. It's not just, Lord, forgive me, I messed up. No, there's a reason you messed up. And you got to get that, you got to uproot that thought system. All right, you got to deal with that system of sin that caused you and led you into that sin. That's the iniquity. All right, so iniquity is purged out uh, progressively in a process. All right, so it's different. That's why David said, forgive me the iniquity of my sin. Like, you forgave my sin, but now forgive me for the reason I sinned. Like, you lied, that's a sin, but why did you lie? What iniquity is there that's causing you to lie? Uh, you fornicated, but why did you fornicate? What iniquity is there that causes you to fornicate? All right, so that's iniquity. Um, I missed another question. I'm taking one more question, then I'm going. I got to make sure it's a really good one. One more question. I missed someone. Someone did about some prophetic training. Well, email me. Someone said I'd like to have you as a, men as a mentor. Email me. Why do prophets live a lonely life? Well, you can read one of Bill Hammond books for that. I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to find one more question that I can kind of, you know, cover more information in that question. Read Prophets and Personal Pitfalls by Bill Hammond. Prophetic training in GA. Okay, if you want prophetic training, then... Um, Email me. Um, I, okay, I guess that's it. I'm out now. I got work to do. It is 12.06. And it is time for me to go. Yeah, we do teachings on marriage all the time. We do teachings on marriage all the time. Me and my wife. So you make sure you follow my wife at Mrs. Amanda Ferguson. M R S A M A N D A F E R G U S O N. Because when she periscopes, sometimes I jump on the periscopes and we talk about relationships together. We talk about marriage, the single life. We expose the games that men play with women, and we expose uh, the games that women play with men. Uh, so you won't waste your time in relationships. So we we deal with the supernatural. We deal with all this stuff, but we're very we, we, we believe in family and life applications, practicality. All right. So we don't believe that uh, being deep is, a, is an excuse for being weird and being practical is an excuse for being shallow. All right. So we our motto is faith and family. So we're both extremes. All right. So uh, y'all make sure y'all follow her. And tune her into her periscopes because she deals with it. Bless you guys. We love you guys. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, paying attention. 
it, it feeds me. Jesus said, my, my meat is to do the will of God. So it really feeds me uh, just to be on and, and teach and impart to people. Uh, I have no lack of words. So as much as you all are hungry for this and you put a demand on it, um, I will do these and I will teach. And of course, this is free of charge. Uh, you don't have to register, all that kind of stuff. It's not a conference, it's a periscope. And um, I'll teach you everything I know, as long as you have a hunger for it. So invite people, post on my Facebook, tweet me, tell people they need to follow this because this word needs to get out. Amen. And um, until next time, love you guys. Ladies, my wife is coming soon with Girl Talk, so tune in to her. And until next time, we will see you